this virtual machine idea right. is that there is no machine-wide file naming yes. uh, system That's right. in, yes. in it. So it really does not, for example, permit a program that is a utility program even to have in it the name of a, uh, of a file that permits it to use directly data from the file. So what's required is that, uh, at least what was required until fairly recently, is that a user, it refers to symbolic file names A through K or something like that, and a user has to connect these explicitly on the outside to some kind of actual um, actual file names and for until very recently their mail system worked by uh, a user uh, one user's program putting cards virtual cards in the virtual card reader of um, uh, of another user That's part of the heritage. Yeah. I, now, part of the reason why CPCMS has these characteristics is that it was being developed at the same time as TSS and uh, IBM has strong objections to duplication of effort, especially since they lead to rivals for official consideration. And they would not permit a rival time-sharing project, and so this thing, uh, essentially, in order to survive, had to, be, uh, had to have a different objective, which was the uh, virtual machine simulation. Now, the virtual machine thing, in spite of all of these disadvantages, has some nice advantages, uh, which is when it comes to debugging operating systems, uh, they're in a reasonably good position because you can do uh, what they call a second level system. Namely, you can uh, run a whole operating system that you intend to, to be your main operating system as a mere user job. Yeah. Uh, and that's pretty nice from the point of view of debugging operating systems. It would be nice if um, if, but, if well, the other operating systems offered that virtual machine uh, facility, but the flaw is the one you mentioned. Right. They can't, I, they can't, oh, have, well, they can't they, have a global file. Yeah, let, let, let me go back uh, to that. That's, that's, that's very deep. Let, let me that's go back very to deep that. Of their flaw, uh, because you, uh, it, one it, of the first things that I learned from Corby was that any good time sharing system had to be built around the file system. Uh, and that's uh, a point of view. It? it is a point of view which, however, proved to be right as far as I know. The trouble is that when I try to explain this point of view to my daughter who works for IBM and her fiancé who also worked for IBM on the sale, I always had trouble then explaining why this is true. Uh, but certainly the, 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 uh, uh, that was the major point. Mm -hmm. And certainly... That was true in CTSS, at least the second version of CTSS that was developed yeah, after the, the starting of Project Mind. Right. The reason you had your trouble is that it, it is a perfectly valid design objective, but it's not a law of nature handed down from right. that outright. No. It's a, a design objective if you regard communication between Absolutely. users as a something of high priority. Right. If you don't, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then of course it is not. But they, they certainly, both Corby and I were, were very much key from the beginning of Project Map to the notion that communication between users was of crucial importance. Where did that idea come from? Huh? Where, from what experience and what background did that idea come from? Well, I, I, first of all, somehow, uh, was part of the notion of a computer utility that I learned from John. Well, I don't recall John ever having that. Well, no, I don't I know. But what I do remember is this, that the very first examples with CTSS, the first version of CTSS, where one had to explicitly link a your own file name to somebody else's file name in order to have your program use somebody else's file, that uh, that was regarded as a big inconvenience and everyone who had that experience, both yourselves in, in f further version of CTSS and the DEC people who developed the DEC file system, uh, immediately uh, allowed within a program full reference to any file on the machine. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I developed, certainly, that, that notion 
of uh, a system being the repository of the knowledge of the community, which I started using very, very early, was a key motivation on my part. And I want to quote, this is quote from I, a quotation. Can I one second? Yeah. Were you at all influenced by Van Bush's ideas on memes? No, no, not at all. No, okay. no, not particular. No. Although I knew about it, that was mm. not what uh, it was really the notion of a computer utility. And if you want a computer utility when you're dealing with information, exchanging information mm. is crucial. And this is something that I wrote uh, six months after the operation, the, the, the Mac system was in operation. Uh, was in the spring, sometimes the spring uh, 64. Uh, it is becoming increasingly evident the system's ability to provide the equivalent accessibility of a private, private computer is only a secondary, although necessary, characteristic. What users find most helpful is the fact the system places literally at their fingertips a great variety of services for writing, debugging, and compiling programs and, fac and facilities for working on programs in their own particular field to the use of appropriate problem-oriented languages. The system using them themselves are beginning to contribute to the system in a substantial way by publishing their work in the form of new commands. Is this whole phenomenon of a computer utility or many people developing things that are used by others, which was the most impressive thing that it happened in the first six months. And that's what, uh, in my memory, was the, the, the real success. And they, again, let me say that this success, in spite of what you said earlier, depended very much on a de unthinkable degree of reliability of the system. Mm. Uh, uh, the, first of all, the two things that made a timeshare impossible were the transistor and the disk file. Mm. Without either of them, you couldn't have had a successful timesharing system. Because, re you know, vacuum tube machines were not up long enough <laughs> to serve for that purpose and the disk file, it couldn't depend on tape for sharing information yeah. and so forth. Mm -hmm. So those were the two really crucial things that, uh, the, the, that made the system work. And uh, um, the, 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 this community phenomenon was really, really impressive. And that's what sold to Naive people, naive about computing, the importance of time sharing system and, and the future. That was but hadn't that community phenomenon that you were saying occurred yeah. in the first six months of Multics already happened on no, the No, no, Multics, CTSS, the first six months of CTSS. Oh, CTSS, okay. That's right, in okay. the period from uh, November 63 to, uh, you know, six months later. This is when I gave a paper, I'm quoting from a paper that I delivered in Washington which was the first report on Project MAC uh, uh, that was eventually written out. Uh, yeah? One comment on that. I, I'm reminded of a slogan at IBM, that IBM loved wild birds so long as they flew in formation. Yeah. Now, <laughs> your, your point about the community interacting with each other, I felt at the time totally stifled by it because the community that was interacting was predominantly systems programmers, programmers doing things like John McCarthy's group, the, the programmer who wanted to do things like see pictures and manipulate graphs and whatnot, he wasn't oh. represented. Oh no, because almost immediately we had the clues on the system. And well, the clues that, in those days was that, an extremely powerful. Yeah, it was too damn powerful because well, it was so well. powerful that it sapped the machine, and it was only used by one group. Well, no, it was, oh no, it was used by lots of different people. You had to sign up. Furthermore, we well, had we're a back second to, one. We're back to batch processing, aren't we? No, uh, no, because you signed up for a long time. A long yeah, time. Zero, we signed up. No, but okay, but was, you're you're correct in saying that that was a very tough problem. Oh yeah, we didn't. You know, we didn't address it as well as we did the more routine typewriter like. That's right. And uh, there was an effort to, dis to develop displays that were consistent with the capability of the system. They were relatively small. Remember, CTSS had a user memory that was 32K. 
That's Wait, well, well, 64. Well, no, no, that yeah. was well, to the system. two banks of 32. Yeah, yeah. The, two banks. In some the way, user has 32. You realize that that's what I have available in my IBM personal computer at home. Yeah, but right you, can, there. you can double that for a couple of bucks. Yeah. Right. No, yeah. but you know. So, but, in, in other words, in those days, the capability that you had for computing sure you can. Uh, were terribly uh, small yeah, and, small. and uh, really a typewriter-like terminal was the only yeah. thing that you could conceive. Uh, as being practical for general use. We tried to develop, uh, and was Rob starts to develop, a display terminal based on a storage display tube, which was quite mm -hmm. efficient, and there were quite a few in use, uh, had some problems, namely that uh, 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 when you wanted to change something, you had to erase the whole oh. damn thing. Tektronix has uh, eventually come out with such a, uh, such a display. But, but that was certainly a deficiency of that system. It could not support any reasonable number of terminals like you had envisioned. It just could not do it. There was no way. Well, I would say mm, it well, could have well, actually, supported a few of the type I had envisioned. A few. Because my envisionment was not a graphics terminal. It was a plotter. But and I'm not it, sure we would have had the impact with just a few. Uh, See, one of the problems not, was we had a subsystem that, that uh, was built to handle up to ten. Uh, uh, by uh, then, we were saying uh, goodbye to each other. There were there but, were people, including you, that were trying to come out with uh, tablets and and uh, uh, I remember my Tuzo had the idea of some kind of a kludge that was at another type of tablet, and but no, but nothing ever came to life. I mean, I, I remember supporting several <coughs> projects of that sort, but never, never was ever completed of that type. Uh, and uh, I will agree with you that uh, the, the sharing of a large time sharing system did put a certain amount of uh, what you call IBM likes of birds as long as they <laughs> find for me, a certain format, call it for people to use in computer, which had, incidentally, obviously, certain limitation, but also had some, some advantage in people being able to build on each other, because if they all use different convention, they will never be able to do so. But had this advantage of uh, stifling certain work, and that was the reason why when Marvin Minsky wanted a PDP-1 and later the PDP-6, uh, I had no question about providing the money, because certainly we wanted to allow people who had needs that didn't fit into that well, to I be think able to, to move along. The whole did way. you provide the money for the PDP-6, or did you I give did. it to it? No, no you did. I mean, the artificial yeah. intelligence group, what at that time, an integral part of Project Mac, is split up from Project Mac uh, in, after I stopped being direct. No, but I thought that no, Deck, absolutely right. Deck gave the computer. No? No. The no. We bought it. Uh-huh. We bought it. We uh, bought that, we bought the PD36, exchanged it for the PC, but, and then we bought the one, the one million, half a million word memory. Uh, see, it my recollection the, uh, of, tech, of Herb's point is that we, we tend to forget how, uh, in today's kind of freewheeling hardware atmosphere, how hard it was to get things done in the hardware of yeah. that day. And in fact, most universities had stopped doing any experimental building. And uh, it took several years of many groups, a lot of them actually in the AI lab, what's today the AI lab, uh, to build up hardware competence and, and, and the ability to be nimble. And we are ultimately seeing the, the fruits of that today in the sense that the AI lab it was the uh, the locus of the list machines that have been built and things of that sort. Because I, but it's, it's a, dec a, a decade and a half later, and uh, it we we didn't recognize at the time how tough it was to to get things done. But I mean, as I look back on the kludge like arrangements, uh, which took several uh, several years yes, to kind of like work it. on, uh, that kind of stuff is done in in a half to a quarter of the time now by many groups. Uh, I'm around. sure you start with large-scale integration, and the, the work so. is a hell of a lot less. 
So uh, well, uh, what's happening now? Fortunately, the AI lab people are grumbling that they've lost all their competence to well, the, that's uh, a, to these spin that's, that's, that's a, a, a transient, which yeah. hopefully is, uh, is temporary. But you know, it, it, that kind of thing does happen. Sure. Well, okay. one of the other things that Multics did, which it got from IBM, was half duplex. Oh well. Uh, let me finish in a moment the story with IBM because uh, there is an interesting point. Bo Evans came up to talk with me. I was supposed it was sometimes in '65 or '66. <coughs> I don't remember the date. Essentially, he wanted to ask me what is that we didn't like about the 360 system. And uh, I remember you and I. I don't remember who else was. Ted probably was still there, made a long list of uh, what we didn't like. And he didn't, didn't, didn't argue, didn't say anything. But uh, relatively recently, meaning, I don't know, something between five and ten years ago, Bo Evans came to give a talk here at MIT and recalled that. And he, he, he had the list of all the things that we... Uh, that we said they were wrong, and they said, well, that we fixed very quickly. That was no problem, and that was no problem, and that was no problem. And then there was really the memory, the virtual memory, that said there was no way at that time that we could have fixed that. And it took until last year or the year before, before we came up with something like that. Well, you know, let me, recon let me reconstruct a little of that. Uh, John Cock, at the time yeah. when we were still trying to encourage IBM to be responsive to us before we made a decision. John Cock, who basically had been into the summer study and was uh, basically on our side, uh, uh, tried to persuade Bo Evans to come to a, to to a demonstration. Well, you and I were giving a, I think it was an IEEE or ACM chapter, uh, le evening lecture, and we're giving it in 10-2-5. <coughs> Oh, that was you, you were giving. Well, I gave the yeah. demo, you gave the talk or something. Uh, and anyway, my recollection was that uh, John got Bo Evans, who was flying from one place to another, to come in. He came in late, he sat still for 20 minutes and walked out before the demo actually finished. And it was clear that nobody could get people's attention. So one of the reasons, so to some extent, when he came up after our uh, selection of GE, uh, he was to some extent eating crow, as uh, both been pretty forthright on that score, but the, it was too late. And so in effect, yeah. uh, he was basically having to accept the fact that they had been kind of had their had blinders on uh, at all the formative period. And, uh, well, he, there is also something that uh, it should be mentioned. It was an official policy of IBM at that time that technical personnel oh. Uh, in the company should not have personal contact with technical personnel or IBM yeah. customers. That was a policy that I did not, I was not aware of until Jim Fabini, <coughs> at the time after being in uh, under secretary, assistant secretary of defense, when he went to IBM as a vice president, uh, taking the Manny Pure had retired, so he took his job. He came up to talk with me, and uh, so happened that Jim Fubini had been a personal friend uh, forever because our mothers were personal friends and our fathers were colleagues in Italy, so I knew forever Jim. Mm -hmm. And he came to my office, I was still director of Project Mac at that time, and he said, look, according to IBM procedure, I should have Phil Bradley here. I said, the hell with it. That's Jim Fubini. Uh, we are all friends. Never mind Phil Bradley. Let's talk. Well, you should, have brought, Phil, you should have brought Phil Bradley along and then you should have talked in Italian. But you see, that's the first time that I became aware of that policy. And that explained a lot of things. Uh, and only later, and I don't know when it is, that that policy was changed. But at that time, anybody coming to MIT to talk with anybody was supposed to have Phil Bradley in tow. Okay. Uh, Should never talk without the... the, uh, the yeah. Uh, Phil has to go, and yeah. so we ought to get his uh, okay. his perspective on these yeah. relations with IBM before he goes. Yeah, let me get it. Uh, 
And then we can have a break for some yeah. coffee or whatever. Well, there isn't an awful lot I should add here, and it was, it's sort of a little aside for, from what you people have been talking about, but certainly the reaction of Bradley and the people up about Bradley was that, that MIT had, had let him down, that here they'd been so nice to MIT all this time, and uh, here the whole bunch just went off and deserted them. And, uh, Let me ask you, Phil, a question. This is important. Did Phil Bradley realize that since we were not spending MIT money, but we were spending up money, I'm we sure. had obligations to talk with all manufacturers, and that in the end, our decision had to be based on technical I had, grounds. I had no, no chance to, to <laughs> explain any of these things. I was lectured to. I see. And, uh, uh, and that was that. By the time I had a chance to draw a breath, he was ready to leave. I see. <laughs> uh, a little later, the uh, government man got hold of me uh, in connection with the IBM trust antitrust suit. Yeah. And uh, this was shortly this after is the, you This is mm -hmm. during the uh, antitrust trial. Or, yeah, 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 we were hearing. Yeah. This was much later. later. Yeah, much several later. years later. Oh, oh okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, I tried to explain some of the things that had gone on, and uh, uh, he was very anxious to find out what IBM, why IBM came in to give the gift in the first place. And I explained that I had spent some time with with Heard to tell him that putting in a, a machine of IBM's equipment uh, meant that the graduates at MIT would, would have experience with their machines, and that this was a, a, a good selling point for them to come in. And he took that as a, as an, uh, a proof that IBM was going to uh, get a complete Lock on monopoly on, on uh, all these matters. I this know is the original 704 you're referring to. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, I never could get him to see that this was uh, a two-way affair. And, uh, of course, by that time I was a little bit annoyed at IBM anyway. So maybe I didn't spend too much time trying to explain. At any rate, he, he thought that I was going to be a very good uh, person to have on his side in the, in the trial. So I spent three days down in New York in the witness box, uh, going over time and time again uh, all the things that had happened and hadn't happened with IBM. And they even brought up the question as to this uh, interview with, with Phil Bradley. Uh, I don't know who it was that had made the decision, but at any rate, IBM lawyers spent very little time questioning me at all. They, they just Left, left the thing right there. Uh, Who made the decision about what? Not to, know, not to cross examine. Not yeah. to, oh, I see. They didn't, they didn't uh, bore in. There was an awful lot of places yeah. where. Probably Katz went back. He was smart enough. Well, hmm? inc yeah. incidentally, P the PDP 1 computer was donated by DEC to the E department essentially for the same reason. Yeah. And were they right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 So, uh, that was the last time I had very much contact with, with the IBM. I can still remember. <coughs> the, uh, one of my recollections of that period was, in the th after we made our decision, uh, IBM, uh, one of the top people from IBM uh, that was in charge of trying to keep us in the fold, I forget his name, uh, came up and, and he was in Charlie Towns' office and I was summoned there. And he was there, obviously, to make one last desperate appeal. And he came up with some uh, oral description of how IBM planned to be responsive with some sort of polymorphic system. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, but maybe you were there, too, Bob. 
And I can still recall attempting what turned out to be one of the flattest jokes I've ever tried. I said, gee, you mean the, the many body problem? We know that can't be solved. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I, and the guy didn't crack a smile. <laughs> well, you know, there was a follow-up that I think that if we are trying to get uh, an oral history should come up because uh, it had quite a lot to do with what happened in computation at MIT, the raft. Um, when we made the decision uh, to go GE, one of the strong support, supporter of Project Mac that was very heavily involved and, 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 and very constructively involved, uh, Charlie Miller, who was then head of the civil engineering, turned very sour. Yes. And I don't, I really don't know what the story was behind, because uh, I, I, I uh, clearly the civil engineering profession was largely using IBM computers, yes. small IBM, small IBM 16, computers. 20. So he, he yeah, was very interested in having his software be developed for the 360. You know, that was very reasonable. Uh, but that was not really an emotional issue, and you know, I always judge people's reaction, you know, uh, is the stimulus that I understand consistent with the reaction, and clearly was not. You know, while the stimulus was strong, the reaction was much, was 10 decibel uh, uh, strong, and I really don't know why. But uh, Charlie Miller turning very strongly sour on this had a lot of consequence. Uh, he was head of civil engineering at that time. The civil engineering department was very computerized as a result of this. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of excellent work going on. Not only but Gordon Brown had become uh, dean by that time, and he was very strongly supporting the effort in the civil engineering department, I think we could reason. But this made Gordon Brown turn strongly against Project Mac, mm. and also an attempt to kind of uh, uh, make somehow peace with IBM, mm. bring IBM into the computation mm. center in one way or another, and uh, play down the other research effort. As a matter of fact, at that point, he was trying to develop a research organization within, yes. uh, um, without, uh, within the, the computation center. And as, as a matter of fact, he hired his head, Bill, uh, Bill, Bill Kale. Bill Kale, who yeah. it didn't work out. But anyway, the net result that he made some deals with uh, Phil Bradley. And that resulted in the 67 coming in the computation center and a lots of other things. Was this when Gordon Brown was one running for president of MIT? Well, no, he wasn't. You were just dean. <laughs> well, I mean, look, uh, Gordon Brown has, uh, a, a, has done a lot of great things, and in many respects is a great person. The, uh, the, the problem, and I, I wouldn't mind his hearing this, that I've had with them always arose from, a, from the fact that any one time there is one paramount objective in his mind, thing that he wants to accomplish. It isn't the same. And everything time. else, yeah. and everything else is 20, 30, 40 degrees below that. But and the next month is a different one. It could be, yeah. At that time, the building up of the civil engineering department and what Charlie Miller was trying to do was paramount in his mind. Was the core uh, controversy involved in this? Was the, what? The case on the uh, That's a patent good point. The core. A question that of the core, far right core right. memory patents. Uh, yeah, been no, that had already been settled. Been no, that, that, that was, uh, uh, there was no problem there yeah, anymore. The there were kind of the leftover in the sense that there was kind of a certain uh, strained relation. Uh, uh, the remain, you know, they, they, they didn't quite know how to deal with one another. But, uh, uh, um, but uh, Jerry Wiesner was a uh, uh, consultant for IBM and he was in the science advisory board already and uh, 
uh, and lots of other things. So the relations with IBM were reestablished quite strongly at that time, and uh, and uh, all the things happened since that are kind of beyond the scope of this discussion. So I would say that now the relations are excellent. Uh, that's about it. Well, is, is MIT paying IBM now for their equipment? Or? We paid them by practically giving them the core patents. <laughs> that was, a, in hindsight, well, was uh, no, no, no. The, the, well. the, the way <laughs> IBM moved completely to a different mode of support in computation in university. That is, they make a gift of money so much a year. And then uh, you which is to you use for research, for whatever, for various things. <coughs> and then the, their equipment pay is paid that. from whatever sources the university has. That is, the two things have been totally dissociated. Yeah. And it was partly as a result of the antitrust suit yeah. that they switched to that mode of but support. I would say, in hindsight, one of the consequences of our selecting GE, uh, which was that I, neither IBM nor MIT takes each other for granted anymore. Yeah. In fact, uh, and that was kind of a valuable precedent, even though that wasn't the yeah. intention. <laughs> In hindsight, was there a different way of playing it to get a better dot product with IBM? If you had to do well, it over it's again... It's too hypothetical, well, Herb. Uh, the problem was that the... Uh, the stream of development began with a 360 genesis, which most of us didn't even know about. Yeah. Uh, and how it might have gone a different way, I don't know. It's just it was a function of personalities and people. If uh, everything had been explained better to Amdahl, it might have made a difference. But you see, there but was a fundamental they, point they, they in had, this they policy had, that they had, well, that except for personal friendship. Yep. I mean, the John Cock always was a personal no, but, friend of Marvin. Uh, and things like that, except, except for personal friendship, no more technical discussion between MIT and IBM, with technical people at IBM, was forbidden. Therefore, I mean, the points of view did not... Yeah, well, let me explain it. No, but let me, let me explain primarily, it. they are really a marketing organization. No, but they were. And you handed them one of their worst marketing defeats in 10 years. Yeah, I suppose. From and the threat of that to T.J. Watson ahead of time might have turned the, turned the tide the other way. But you know, there were lots of things that went wrong. For instance, another thing that went wrong is that when I saw that we were going to decide leaning toward GE before we made the final decision, I went to see Charlie Towns because I thought he should know that that would look like we were going to the side, and I thought that the provost would then pick it up from there and talk with the president and you know, and, and think about the concept. That did not happen. I don't understand why Charlie Town just missed the boat. I don't think he thought he, he did not didn't understand, appreciate, didn't, appreciate, yeah. didn't appreciate the importance of the issue. So I found out later that he had done nothing. It but, did not work IBM, it did not work J. Stratton, it, it just did, do, didn't do anything. So, when Manny Puri just dashed into J. Stratton's office, hid in the city because he had just heard of our decision, J. Stratton wasn't prepared, uh, it just... There, there's another, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to play what if, but I think the... Yeah, that's uh, fun. <laughs> but there, there's, in defense of the IBM, technical team. I think that you have to reconstruct a little bit what they were trying to do. And one of the key things that they were trying to do was to... Uh, IBM, prior to the 360, had a dozen different machines. And one of the key, key charters was to try to design a machine which would replace every one of them. That's right. And it was a tremendous political, technical, political yeah. struggle inside IBM to come up with a homogeneous solution that was still had some engineering cleanliness. And I'm pretty sure that Brooks and uh, Amdahl and Lau felt that it was all they could do to, to kind of map uh, a single a solution to the present problems uh, together. 
and that they didn't really see how they could be um, adventurous in the design. And time-sharing to them was just uh, off on the left field as, a, as an experiment that they didn't need to try to incorporate at the same yeah. time. A further complication yeah. uh, was the fact that at that time, hardware and software were dealt with totally separately by, by separate groups of people. So if there was anybody in IBM that understood the notion of time-sharing, uh, in the world were software people. And my understanding there was a huge battle in the specification of the 360 between hardware and software people and that the software people lost and as a matter of fact several key software people at IBM left as a result, left the company as a result of that battle. Oh, uh, also, it, there's a, a phenomenon known as the second system effect, which is well, you always try to do too much in the next one. Uh, and to some extent, they did that. You know, they they said oh, they took all of the functionality that was in every operating system they had, and they ordered it all together. And they said this is going to be OS 360. Yeah. And IBM commandeered the largest software army that had been put together in, since maybe the Sage project. Uh, and they tried to deliver on schedule on a schedule, and they had a hell of a time. And as we they now didn't. we now recognize as a familiar pattern uh, of any large software team, uh, they didn't see it till they were in it. So they barely squeaked through. They didn't, for a while there, the first six months after they delivered it, they didn't know whether they were going to make it or not. I think it wasn't a sure thing in their eyes, uh, largely because the software was such a mess. In fact, we had a joke about it. Uh, uh, People and just when we were talking about the TSS project, we somebody casually said, "I understand that they've got all the instructions. They just haven't figured out what order to put them in yet." Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, look, uh, IBM is a very interesting company. Uh, one of the things it does, John, I learned from his mistakes. Oh, they did very well, uh, and they did. Uh, also, you have to realize that IBM did not start as a technical company. It started out as basically a, down as, a, as a as a uh, marketing company, uh, which has been uh, is uh, its great strength and has become over the time much more of a technical company than it used to be, uh, and is still strong marketing oriented. Uh, but at that time, it was so marketing-oriented that they missed the boat on technical thing. And they are trying very hard not to do the same thing again. They've been better at reacting yeah. than, than at initiating. Shall we stop now for a while?